science enthusiasts, I'm your host, Jason Zakowski. I'm a high school chemistry teacher, but you probably know our dogs, Bunsen and Beaker. They're the science dogs on social media. This show takes what's best from their account, the curiosity and fun found there, and swirls it into podcast form. Every week, we're going to take some deep dive into an area of science and look at the research that's going on with our pets. We'll also have an expert guest who will enthrall you with their area of knowledge. This is The Science Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to The Science Podcast. We hope you're happy and healthy out there. I am recording this early on Thanksgiving. Yes, the Canadian Thanksgiving. Um, Canadians celebrate Thanksgiving on the 11th of October. I think it fluctuates from year to year. And it definitely bamboozles our American friends because they're like, wait a second, you don't celebrate Thanksgiving on the same date we do? No, no, it's kind of a confusing thing. It's not confusing for Canadians and and we don't call it Canadian Thanksgiving. We just call it Thanksgiving. (laughs) It was a really good discussion on Twitter about it, actually. The big reason why Canadians have Thanksgiving in October is it's to celebrate the harvest. That's the main reason. And the harvest is generally done in September. So I know the Americans celebrate Thanksgiving in November and there's a lot of like, is it in November because of the pilgrims or because of Abraham Lincoln or some kind of holiday thing? If we celebrated Thanksgiving in November, most of Canada would be under snow and that would make a lot of sense. Uh, You'd have to wait a month or two after the harvest. So if you're listening to this a little bit after, I hope you had a great Thanksgiving and a normal Monday for everybody else in the world. What's on the show this week? In science news, I get to talk about giant sloths. Oh boy, I'm so excited. I'll, I'll explain why later. In pet science, some new evidence came out about early dog migration. Um, really exciting stuff. Our guest and ask an expert is astrophysicist Cheyenne Pullius. Get to talk about space. Hey dogs, now speaking of cleaning up a house because you're so hairy, <laughs> why do you have to clean your house in space so much? Well, there's stardust everywhere. <laughs> Okay, on with the show. There's no time like science time. Okay, we have to talk about giant sloths. And it's actually kind of a scary story about giant sloths, but I have to tell you the background. And I forget if I've mentioned this on the podcast before. My family loves going to museums. I love museums. Uh, When we were in New York City, we went to all the museums. And then when we got back to Canada, a couple of teachers were like, hey, did you go check out a Yankees game or some other sports. And I'm like, no, why would we do that? There's so many museums to see. And they thought we were a little bananas. One of the things I look for in museums, two things. One is a giant sloth skeleton or a giant sloth creation. And the other is the Ankylosaurus, my favorite dinosaur. Now, the reason why I keep looking for giant sloths is this is a long time ago, like 10, 12 years ago. I was teaching a class. Um, it's one of my favorite classes to teach in high school. It's, it's, a, it's a class for in between our most academic kids and the kids that really struggle at school. I really like teaching it. It's really varied. And there's a geology component. And one of the things in the geology component we talk about is ancient animals that have gone extinct. And I was talking about how old the earth was. There's these creatures that roamed on the earth called megafauna, so big animals. And one of them was the giant sloth. And there was a group of kids that didn't believe the earth was that old. They they probably were from, you know, religious families and, and they did not agree the earth was that old. And they thought I was making up stuff about these giant animals like giant sloths. So it just so happened that that weekend I was going, I was going to the Terrell Museum, which is a dinosaur museum in Alberta. And I found a giant sloth skeleton and I took a picture, a selfie with it. And I showed the classes a little bit. Ha ha, they exist. Here's evidence of me with a sloth skeleton. They still didn't believe me. So now I make a point of every single museum I go to of taking a selfie with a giant sloth. So that's my giant sloth story and why I love them so much. (laughs) I don't know if I ever convinced those kids that the earth was really old and giant sloths exist, but I don't care. I get to take pictures with giant sloths in every museum and it's kind of fun. All right. So what is this new study? Well, if you know anything about giant sloths, the, the videos and pictures and like the simulations of how they move, these sloths were huge. They were three meters long. And when they stood up, they were huge. Like they they would be able to eat the tallest leaves off trees. They would make a human 
looked tiny and they would weigh up to 2,000 pounds. So they were huge. Some of the skeletons I've taken a, a picture with, you know, they're three, four times as tall as I am when they stand up. And we always thought, or I always thought that they were vegetarians. Like they, they were so big because all of the predators were huge and they had to, it was like kind of an arms race. And then they could eat leaves from the top of the trees. But paleontologist Julia Tejeda of the University of Montpellier in France looked at chemicals in the hair um, of these giant sloths. And they found the chemical makeup for a couple amino acids, which could only come from meat sources. So they looked at the, the fossilized hair and these amino acids in the hair could have only come from meat, meat sources, which means the giant sloths would have had to ingest animal protein to get that protein, those amino acids in their hairs. Now, the, the sciencey part is they were looking for nitrogen isotopes specifically in one amino acid, glutamine, and glutamine, these isotopes change, drastic, change drastically with diet, meaning that... Um, the 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 the, the food that they eat changes the nitrogen in that isotope. The reason why they keyed in on glutamine is that there's not really other amino acids that change with diet like glutamine does. So by looking at these isotopes, a cool thing was is they could eliminate like stuff from the environment. It couldn't have been environment causing the nitrogen to these nitrogen isotope, isotopes and glutamine to build up. It had to have been their diet. And what their conclusion is, is kind of shocking. It, the, the prevailing theory is that these giant sloths were vegetarian. They were herbivores. That's because all of the modern species of sloths are also vegetarians. And their jaws, the, the, old, the ancient sloth jaws, weren't adapted for hunting. But what the sloths could have done is eaten kill like other killed prey kind of opportunistically or as a scavenger and one of the one of the interesting things is that the giant sloth could have filled the niche of a scavenger because around this time where this animal lived in what was once you know what is now south america it's a puzzle because there's not very many scavenger and carnivorous animals in that area and the sloth could have filled that niche to kind of like be the scavenger itself and pick up after the big meat eaters killed prey. One more reason to love the giant sloth or be terrified of it. Oh, I would, you know, Jurassic Park is one thing. Welcome to Jurassic Park, seeing a Tronosaurus Rex, seeing a, you know, a giant long necked dinosaur or Brachiosaurus, whatever. I would love to see a giant sloth. So science, get on it. That's science news for this week. This week in pet science, we're going to talk about ancient dogs and the humans that were their companions. We've spoken about this before on the podcast, that the Arctic communities had dogs, sled dogs, that were critical to their survival. Now, a new study seems to show that because we can track the movement of Arctic dogs and how they were, how they were breeding with dogs not of the Arctic, we can also then track the trade routes of these ancient Arctic humans. It's really interesting. So the crux of it is that these ancient Arctic communities, like in Siberia, were thought to be super isolated. They, you know, they, they didn't actually intermingle their DNA with the population. They were way far away from any of their kind of civilization. And they definitely had Arctic sled dogs to help them around. However, new evidence is showing a couple things. One piece of evidence allowed scientists and archaeologists to start pondering and thinking and finding more evidence about the movement of these Siberian people. A discovery of a grave of a dog that was two, about 2,000 years old in the Yamal Peninsula in Russia that was buried with glass beads. Now, glass beads in Siberia would be impossible to make, which means those glass beads had to come from further south or further west, not of Siberia. Which the conclusion of the archaeologists is that the Siberian people maybe had trade routes. After this uh, discovery, it sent a couple uh, archaeologists searching for more evidence of this trade route. This was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Tatiana Fjordburn um, is an archaeologist at the University of Copenhagen that went digging further. Ah, digging. So the her impetus was that dogs and their humans rarely separate for hundreds and hundreds of kilometers, right? Dogs bred 
for work in the Arctic would stay very, very close to their humans. They wouldn't wander, right? Some dogs wander, of course, uh, but the majority of them don't. Uh, they have a patrol route. We we don't let Munson and Beaker just roam outside our house. We don't have a, a fenced yard and we're close to a highway, so we just don't want to lose them on the highway. But I, you know, other farm dogs ra- roam about, but they stay on the farm. It's not like they decide to go on a thousand kilometer trek. This hypothesis means that if you can follow the dogs, that means the humans probably were there too. So the team analyzed DNA from the remains of 49 Siberian dogs. They're about 11,000 year old bone fragments. And they found that these Siberian dogs, unlike their, you know, the Siberian people, were mixing with other dogs from European descent. 7,000 years ago. So the DNA from these Arctic dogs was found in European dogs. The the, the idea is that the humans probably came with the dogs for a trade route. Even more profound is that trekking with these dogs to create a trade route probably also spread ideas like metalwork and also changing the Siberian culture from hunter-gatherer to reindeer herding. Maybe people saw the Europeans having cows and they're like, hey, we got sort of cows up north where they've got antlers. Let's uh, let's kind of do the same thing. It's so interesting that because dogs are so intertwined with us, they live with us so closely, they are now markers that archaeologists can use to track human movement. That's pet science or dog science or just cool science for this week. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to our show week after week. If you want to know how to support the science podcast, here are a couple ways. It's always going to be free to download, so you'll never have to worry about paying for it. But, you know, things do cost money running a podcast, and and here are a couple ways you could help us out. One is join our Patreon page. It's amazing. It's growing. It's almost like an extended family. There's multiple tiers of support, and we have lots of fun perks for being part of our Patreon page. The other way you could support us is giving us an awesome review on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, anywhere you can rate our podcast. Give us a great review. The third way you could support the show is checking out the BunsenBurnerBMD.com website. We have awesome merch there. We worked really hard finding quality merchandise that's comfortable with vibrant colors. And you'll find in limited quantities over the next couple months, maybe even less, the 2022 Bunsen and Beaker calendar. So three ways to support us. The Patreon page. Two, give us a great review. Three, head over to our merch stop and see if there's anything there you'd like. Thanks, everybody. Now on to the interview section. It's time for Ask an Expert on the Science Podcast. And I have Cheyenne Poyus with me today. How are you doing, Cheyenne? I'm good, thank you. Really excited to be here. Yay! Uh, where <laughs> where are you calling into the podcast from? So I'm currently in London in the UK right now. Oh, okay. Across, what do they call it? Across the pond? Is that what they yeah. say for us? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do you say we're across the pond in North America? Yep. I say you guys are across the pond. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like when I go interview guests from Australia, I'm like, hey, you're down under. And they're like, no, you're up there. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um are you a born and raised person from London like is or is like uh, the UK England your home no it's not so I was born and raised in St Lucia uh okay. in the Caribbean so a lovely tropical island uh so, and I moved to the UK when I was 19 to start my degree in astrophysics so that's why I'm here oh nice cool 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 uh you obviously must still have lots of uh f- family back in St Lucia yeah, most of my family is back in St. Lucia. All right, Cheyenne, let's talk about you. You're an astrophysicist. <laughs> I'm so excited to talk to you. I'm so excited. Um, what We usually just, you know, the first bit is just talking about how, like, how did you become an astrophysicist? Um, I would be curious, and I think our, 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 our listeners would be too, if you shared your story there. Like, what did you, how did you become an astrophysicist? Yeah, so I think thinking back, it definitely started when I was really young. I grew up as an only child. Um, I do have siblings, but in my household, it was just me for a while. So I spent a lot of my time watching documentaries instead of running around and playing like most children would. Um, <laughs> really? That's so cool. <laughs> Look, any any kind of documentary, Cheyenne? Yeah, I was glued to like the Discovery Channel and then eventually uh, National Geographic Channel. Um, yeah. I watched Eddie and everything. I loved any like the nature ones, the medical ones, but I always remember the space documentaries being my absolute favorite. 
Hmm. Um, mostly because of the graphics. Like, it's really cool that the artist depictions and stuff that they have in those documentaries. Space is beautiful. So just looking at those always made me very happy. But I think uh, space documentaries were my favorite because while I was learning stuff about space and getting to know more about the universe we live in, the documentaries almost always ended with another question. It was like, we've spent an hour telling you about all this amazing stuff and all what we know, but actually there's still more that we don't know. <laughs> and that kind of um, like in between feeling of like, I'm really satisfied, but now you've left me even more curious, um, I think uh, is what kept me very. So it didn't make you, that. it didn't make you frustrated, Cheyenne. It made no, that it you didn't. like, you I like that part. To, <laughs> I just wanted to know more. And I just, every time I found another one, I thought, okay, maybe this one might answer another question. And this one might answer the question that the last one didn't answer, but it was always just a new question. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> you were just hungry for information that's wow that's so cool that's the mark of a scientist right there yeah I always just was very curious and wanted to know more and that inevitably that like, came into like my school life once I started going to school I was like oh this is a place just for learning new things this is great <laughs> so, <laughs> I enjoyed I really did enjoy school and when I started um, doing science it quickly very quickly became my favorite subject and then eventually splitting into the three sciences so biology chemistry physics Mm -hmm. and chemistry and physics were my favorite but then realized physics something about physics just was a bit more exciting to me I remember my very first physics class so just separate physics when they said the definition of physics is the study of how the universe works and I was like this is exactly what I want to do (laughs) Did you remember back to when you were a kid and you were like, this is the thing that answers the questions? Yeah, exactly. Oh. It was exactly that kind of feeling. It was like, there's a whole subject. Because up until that point, I had no idea what physics really was. I kept hearing all the scientists' names being thrown around. Biology, chem- I knew biology was to do with you know people and plants and life. I knew that much. Chemistry, things change color and they blow up and they bubble. Um, <laughs> but physics wasn't, it was just like every everyone I asked what was physics, they were like, oh, it's a lot of math. And I was like, well, okay, you don't sound very enthusiastic about that. So it was just this kind of black box of like, what actually is physics? And then they said, it's basically how the world and the universe works. And I was like, why is nobody else excited about this? This is great. <laughs> <laughs> and then from so, there, it went into your, uh, like your, your, your after high school education. Yeah, so during high school, actually, I was doing a project on some of the the great scientists. And one of the ones that I had to research was Galileo. And I saw that he was a physicist, he was an astronomer, he was a mathematician. And then some at some point in doing my Google searches, I saw the word astrophysics. And I was like, whoa, did they just combine astronomy and physics? Like, I didn't know that <laughs> could be done. And looking, I spent the rest of the night Googling astrophysics and figuring, trying to figure out what it was. And then I saw that there were degrees in it. And I was like, this is an entire field, like an entire branch of science all by itself. And then that's when I think that's when things clicked. Like all of those space documentaries I was watching were just breaking down the physics of what was happening in our universe. And physics was that underlying science that explained things in space. And from that night, I was like, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. There's no question. Like you, oh you're telling me my favorite science is what they're using to explain like one of my favorite things, which is space. Wow. Um, yeah. So that's, that. like my, my passion and my goal in life just kind of fell in my lap, to be honest. It was like, oh, I already love these things and there's an entire field dedicated to it. So that's how astrophysics got onto the agenda. I can hear it in your voice. You're just like, you're just so passionate to talk about it. And it, um, some, so, you know, some people on the podcast, they don't know until they get to post-secondary and they go through a couple of years and then they, the thing that they love comes to them or like, maybe it doesn't, they, they find a path to the thing they love, but um, it's really cool when you find it a little earlier in life, the the thing you've been searching for. Um, gave me goosebumps, actually, you talking about it. It's really cool. <laughs> Um, and then you, you went to the United Kingdom to, to London for your post-secondary or you just there, uh, like, I think you mentioned that, right? So, uh, the way it works, uh, in St. is close to like the European, um, schooling. So we have 
high school to our secondary school. Um, but we finish that around 16 and then we go on to college. So like, well, what we call college, but like A-level for two years. And then we go off to university, which is what you guys call college. So oh. it's, so I spent two years after um, secondary school in a, a community college in St. Lucia. Um, and it was to do that extra qualification. I think it's called like advanced level something, something, but it's A-level. <laughs> um, okay. And I there was kind of, you do fewer subjects. So I did chemistry, maths, physics, and then there were some compulsory ones like communication studies and uh, Caribbean studies because it was a, a school in the Caribbean. Um, mm-hmm. So I spent two years doing that and then I needed those qualifications to get into a UK university. So that's when I came to the UK uh, when I was like 18 going on 19. Actually, my 19th birthday was when I landed in the UK. On your birthday? Um, yes. Yeah. Was that a good birthday present or was it kind of terrifying? It was, I think it was very exciting. It wasn't planned. It was just when I was organizing my stuff with my visa, things kind of got a little bit delayed. So as soon as my visa got approved, uh, my dad just booked the very next flight and it just happened to be, um, I traveled the day before, but I landed in um, the UK the next day on the morning of my birthday. So (laughs) I think I think it was a good birthday gift. Like it's kind it's yeah. kind of nice, it's kind of sentimental to be like, oh, the first day I came to kind of pursue my dream was like on my birthday. Like, so yeah, I, I kind of see it as as a, like it was an exciting birthday for sure. That's cool because if if anything in in astrophysics you're exploring, and uh, you you know your first journey was this big, you know this big exploration from one side of the world to the other like across the the ocean that's cool yeah exactly ah <laughs> uh, you're very brave if i if i think back to when i was 19 if and i like i'm from canada like canada to england i mean there's an accent difference and that's about it um <laughs> you know and you know slightly you know our humor is similar to british humor it's kind of dry and uh but like i'd be terrified out of my mind be like i don't know where to go why is everybody driving on the wrong side what the heck <laughs> I I think um when I think back a lot of people did ask me like were you were you scared to to leave home and go so far away um and I think back and I think I didn't realize how big of a move it was because I've been planning it for so long like for as mm. long as I can remember I knew that I'd have to travel to go to university because in which I didn't have a university Mm-hmm. So we had like the University of the West Indies, but that would still be in another Caribbean island. So I knew that if I wanted to go to university, I would have to travel. That was just one of the things that was true for me. So when it came to the point of, OK, well, I want to go to university in the UK. Um, thankfully, my daddy was in the UK. So um, it wasn't like I was going there completely by myself, but it was also mm. the fact that I knew it had to be done. Um, and it wasn't until I was there for a couple of months that I was like, whoa, I literally just moved. <laughs> it hits you a little bit later yeah. hey <laughs> yeah. what like what are you working on right now like you're you're done i believe correct are you done your your training or are you continuing further yeah, yeah so i did an integrated master's program so it just basically joined a bachelor's degree and a master's degree into one four-year program mm-hmm. usually a bachelor's in the uk is three years so the additional year was that master's qualification um, so I did that for, oh, well, it turned out to be five years because I ended up taking a break to do an internship, but I did that for five years. And last year I graduated, uh, with my master's in astrophysics. So I can officially call myself an astrophysicist now. Um, but yeah, right now I'm actually working in finance technology where <laughs> we can, we can get into that a bit later on, but yeah, I'm done with okay. my astrophysics, um, program for now, but I'm definitely planning on going back. Okay, perfect. Perfect, perfect. So, um just a couple follow-up questions uh, and we can get into the what 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 you're doing now a little later. Um uh after well, like one of the things that I uh that in your profile is this amazing video about uh how climate change and space are connected. Well, while you're maybe not working in climate change right now, it'd be really interesting. Could you could you talk about that? Is that something you would be able to explain to us? Yeah, sure. So that video came from, so I'm part of an organization called the Space Generation Advisory Council, uh, volunteering with them. And it's a global organization that's trying to raise awareness of how space technology and space exploration 
can benefit everyone, um, everyone all over the world. Like the the whole thing is like spaces for everyone. Um, so in our group with uh the other members from the uh Caribbean um volunteers, we kind of put together this video series and a webinar series as well, focusing on how climate change, focusing on how space technology can help with sustainability in the Caribbean. So focusing on some of those sustainable development goals with climate action being one of them. So the connection between climate change and space is the fact that when we think of space, we often think of astronauts and going to Mars and like that's all very cool and very exciting. But sometimes we tend to forget like a lot of the space technology is satellites and satellites help you with everyday things like they give you your Wi-Fi, they give you weather forecasting, they give you your Google Maps. So people tend to sometimes don't really connect space technology with everyday life. And that's where the climate action um, and the climate change connection comes in, because those weather satellites that are they're forecasting your daily data, but they're also helping you monitor weather patterns on a longer, longer term as well. We also have like high altitude weather balloons that's also considered part of space technology um, that help you monitor changes in the Earth's atmosphere. Um, satellites can also help you monitor natural disasters like hurricanes, cyclones, these disasters that are expected to get worse um, as climate change happens. So that's kind of the connection there is that these satellites which are in space orbiting the Earth uh, actually have a very big part to play in how we monitor climate change and how we help reduce some of the risks of climate change and damages as well. Hmm. What, I've heard it. I've heard it said before. I don't know. I don't know if you would agree or not that, um, like, climate change scientists and climate change is literally astrophysics of our own planet. Like, it, there's very there's big similarities between studying Mars and the weather there and Earth and the weather here. Yep, definitely that as well. I like I, when a part of my degree was learning about all the different solar system planets and why they have the temperatures that they do and the at, like the atmospheres that they do. And they're right; it's a very there is a connection when you think of climate change and when you think of astrophysics because the problem with climate change is that you're affecting how like the temperature of our planet one and affecting how our planet kind of normally does things. So how the atmosphere normally um behaves which would be the hurricanes and the other natural disasters that we expect that we've been seeing um for the longest time so you're changing those things and you're changing that on a global scale um so there is definitely a connection and like studying other planets and studying if if you look at venus for example venus is very similar to earth and it's believed that it started off very similar to earth and could have possibly even had life in the past or had the potential to develop life because they see the planets um, being so similar. But Venus ended up with what's called the runaway greenhouse effect. So we hear about greenhouse gases a lot and how they're, they're heating up our planet. Um, Venus ended up with a runaway greenhouse effect that just kept getting the planet hotter and hotter and hotter. And now, even if it's similar to Earth in terms of size and distance from the sun, it's the hottest planet in the solar system and very much inhabitable for humans. <laughs> so all of those, studying all of those things just makes us realize just how delicate the balance of everything is on our planet and why climate change is such a big risk. Hmm. It's pretty profound. Thank you. That's, I'm just, I'm just in, in a deep, a deep think right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. The temperature on, I don't know the temperature on Venus. I know it's like crazy, crazy hot and, it, like spacecrafts that try to land they just melt away so um or they, yeah, they don't so last I think, very long I think a bit of a bit of context so the average temperature on earth when you look at it on a global scale all the different areas the average is 16 degrees celsius not sure what that is in fahrenheit i need to get better by fahrenheit <laughs> but um 16 degrees celsius um which is probably what you get like you know fall temperature like kind of getting colder but not really that cold and Venus is 450 degrees Celsius. <laughs> Good grief. <laughs> so a little bit hotter. Just a smidgen. Just, just a smidgen. A little bit. Not too much, you know, just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I'm so curious. NASA an announced two new, like, missions to Venus, right? I think one's a lander and one's a satellite. And yeah. I'm curious how they're going to build that lander. Um, 
Because I'm, I don't know. That's that's some crazy temperatures they're going to have to deal with. <laughs> yeah, definitely. They're going to need a lot of um, just like insulation, kind of block off the heat <laughs> from getting in, and cooling systems. And there's going to be a lot of engineering and science going into that for sure. Cool, cool. Um, a fun question before before my next kind of follow up one is that uh, you were mentioning the planets. I always ask uh, folks who study the sky and study space. Uh, do you have a favorite planet? My favorite planet is actually Venus. Um, it is? Oh, it cool. Is. Yeah, it's funny that we were talking we were talking about Venus. Um, I think it's, it's just that same thing I was mentioning, that Venus is so similar to Earth when you think about just size and just, just its characteristics. It could have been so similar to Earth. So I always call it like Earth's evil twin. <laughs> um, <laughs> because... But I think what made Venus my favorite is when I was learning about it and learning about all the different processes that they believe um, led to the planet being so hot. So what I just was talking about before, about Mm -hmm. that runaway greenhouse effect, and they think that it could have been a result of Venus having oceans in the past and the oceans evaporating and even water vapor is like a greenhouse gas. So that traps Mm -hmm. heat as well. So they're saying that if the oceans are evaporating and um there's more water vapor in the atmosphere that makes it hotter and that's kind of you know starting off that runaway greenhouse effect so i think just learning the science behind how venus could have been earth but didn't quite get to that point i i don't know that was very fascinating to me to see that just just those just like something that could have been a very small change just kind of threw everything off balance and i think that's Hmm. why Venus ended up being my favorite because it was one of the ones that I found most interesting learning about how it came to be what it is today. It must feel, it fills me with wonder. It probably does too. You like, uh, if you're thinking, if you think like a couple changes in the past, Venus could be like another earth. Like imagine the differences we would have. We would have another planet to go explore within striking distance that could have life like us, but it did just didn't go that way. It became this like death planet. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. When the exact opposite, like that would have been cool if you develop technology. You're like, yeah, I'm just going on vacation to Venus to like meet some new humans. Like, yeah, it, it would have been really cool. When when you start talking, like I'm not you. I know a little bit about space. I know how big stars are relative to the Earth. Uh, but like all of these things are just so out of the realm of your average everyday experience. Like I can see why astrophysicists are just so passionate about the universe because <laughs> it's so wild. Like, you know, isn't it? It's just bananas, isn't it? It is. It really is. I was just, uh, last night I was just looking at the moon and I was thinking my, the way my brain works and the things I think about is probably so different from everyone <laughs> else because I was just looking at the moon and it was a half moon and my brain just started thinking like, okay, I'm seeing half of the moon because the sun is lighting up half of the moon and the position that the moon is in its orbit. Like that's why I'm seeing half. Like I just started going into the astrophysics behind why I'm seeing this half moon. And I was like, it was making me so excited because you learn all of these, like I learned all these things in my degree and it's very theoretical and it's very much, like you say, it's kind of sometimes so far removed from everyday life. And I'm so fascinated. And I believe that of course, like it exists and we have evidence for it and we see things in our telescopes. Um, But then when you actually witness like something as small as just looking at the moon, you're like, this is the moon that's orbiting around us because we're just like a blue marble just floating through space. Like we're existing in this universe and sometimes we just don't even remember that. So it, 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 it is exciting and it is a very interesting perspective to have when you're kind of just going through everyday life and working a nine to five and just like doing, <laughs> the, doing the things that everyone else does but sometimes I just sit there for a while and I think we're, we're existing in an amazing universe <laughs> so like do you ever do you ever do you ever have trouble relating to some of your friends they're like oh my god this happened to me today and you're like just stop for a second and I will tell you about the problems of our nearest star right like <laughs> <laughs> Does I it ever think, get does it get that bad sometimes? <laughs> I I think I've learned to uh, keep it keep most of it in my head. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> my friends my friends are definitely um really good. Like they always ask me questions and they love when uh-huh. I talk about space and they love when I explain things about space. But um I try not to be like, oh don't worry, like don't worry about this 
problem in your life right now. Like, you know, because you're so small and we're just on a little marble. Like, don't worry about it. I could live (laughs) for like 70, 80 years. And the universe has been around for like billions of years. Like it's your life is insignificant. Like, (laughs) can you imagine? Can you imagine? (laughs) Nobody would ever want to talk to you. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, going and be like, I shouldn't have to pay taxes because it doesn't even matter in the grand scheme. (laughs) No, definitely not. I, I kind of have a a very balanced perspective and I see I see the beauty in just like the little um the ways that we live life and the ways that we are kind of not so much disconnected, but we don't think about just how big the universe is and just all of those things <laughs> that are going on. Like I still see like it's 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 relevant because sometimes I tell myself I can't get too carried away with, with thinking about things like that. I, I, I'm just, I'm just laughing. I'm just thinking about how I'm glad you're so grounded. Cause I can think about like, if you had, if you, if you had a little bit less grounding, um, like you could, it's the average astrophysicist could potentially become so insufferable. Like they would just be yeah, like, just your like earthly talking. problems are nothing mortal, you know? <laughs> just shouting um, in the middle of the street, like nothing matters in this world. Like, oh. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Um uh before we move on to the kind of the fun questions, uh did you want to talk about what you're working on right now like what your 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 job? Uh, you we mentioned you mentioned that at the start of the podcast. Yeah, sure. So I'm currently working in finance technology, so my company uh we kind of provide data and software for investment professionals, so like institutions like investment banks and insurance companies. Um so definitely not astrophysics at all. Um, but I am in the analytics team. So a lot of my role is kind of helping our clients with the more technical products. And it, it brings in that aspect of problem solving and data analysis that I did do a lot of in my physics degree, hmm. uh, which is probably why I landed the job um, with because I knew nothing about finance before I started. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, that's like what I'm doing now. And that kind of just uh, came about as an opportunity when I was looking for jobs. I knew that I would the more abundant jobs out there for physics graduates are definitely in data data science and and the finance world loves us for our problem solving and our coding skills as well so it wasn't a surprise that I ended up in you know in a corporate film that does something that's not exactly physics um but I am just enjoying the experience for now um and definitely everything I do outside of work is still space related and still science related because I haven't lost that that passion for it. Yeah. We'll talk about that uh, at the end of the podcast. Like, I guess, you know, you know, like it makes total sense. If you can figure out how the universe works, you can probably figure out how our financial system works. Um, I am not that smart. I, people have tried to explain Bitcoin and now these NFTs to me a bunch of times. And it's just like, I feel like I'm Michael Scott from the office. I'm like, you need to explain this to me. Like I'm five. Like I do not every t- it does make no sense to me so um like folks with you that are like ha i know how the stars do the thing and and it must it <laughs> and like yeah i can I, yeah i can figure out your money folks so yeah <laughs> but that's cool that's great that there's some um skill transference there um yeah yeah definitely i think physics physics graduates or like stem graduates in general actually are like some of the most employable people out there and not putting mm-hmm down any other degree like all degrees are useful and have their place in this world but I think the way the world is moving now with everything getting you know being connected to technology and the fact that you're leaving your degree with these numerical skills and these programming skills and just problem solving skills like when you think about it every pretty much every business in the world is formed off of trying to solve a problem so if you have problem solving skills which is something you develop while doing science because you're trying to figure out how things work like you're very, very employable. And I am very grateful to have learned that during my degree. So I was able to kind of sell myself um, better when I was applying for jobs. But I think people definitely underestimate what you can do with like a natural science degree. Hmm. That's so true. <laughs> like, and, and you don't give up easily, right? Like, very true. <laughs> like especially if you've t- pursued like some kind of research, like every day is a bad day in research sometimes. Like every day, yeah. nothing works. Yeah. And you, you've, got, you've got to like, oh man, this didn't work. And you got to like, especially if you're coding, you're like, oh, I spent all day and I pressed enter and it just went error. Yep. So, you know, 
got to figure it out. So yeah, I can see that. That's cool. <laughs> so a couple of the standard questions we ask on the podcast, because we're, we uh, put animals and science together is to have our guests share a pet story. Um, do you have a, do you have a pet story from your life you could share with us? Yeah, sure I do. So I grew up most of my life uh, having small dogs. I did have turtles at one point, but I was very young, so don't mm-hmm. remember much about them. But I did have a lot of small dogs. And my last dog, when I was living back in St. Lucia, um, I always remember she she would always kind of wait outside my door around the time that I would be waking up and could just waking up to get ready for school. Um, and there was one day I was sick and I wasn't going to school, so I didn't come out. And my mom and everyone else walking around the house, she just kind of laid by my door. And people were just like, okay, I guess she's waiting. She's waiting for Cheyenne to come out, but Cheyenne's not coming <laughs> out this morning because she's sick. Uh, and as soon as my mom opened the door to tell me something, she just flew onto my bed. Like she doesn't, she didn't normally come onto the bed. Sometimes she would very like creep into the room a little bit and like see if maybe I would call her to like play with her. Like, but she knew that you know not that she wasn't allowed on the bed but just not something she ever really did she would come up close to the bed and she would you know look with those big puppy dog eyes and want you to pick her up but that morning as soon as the door opened she just she just ran and and, like jumped onto my bed and she just laid next to me she didn't like do anything she just kind of laid there and I was like oh my gosh it's so it's to me it's so crazy how observant animals are especially dogs like you like you didn't think like every morning she waits for me okay fine but you never think like she would actually be worried or curious as to like oh but you didn't come out this morning like where are you like what are you doing like what's going on um, <laughs> and I always remember that because yeah it just I, I wasn't expecting it I wasn't expecting her to just kind of jump on and just you know she like she just it kind of seemed like she just wanted to know that I was okay and like everything was fine because I didn't come uh, out that morning oh uh, yeah we don't deserve dogs they're just <laughs> so <don't>. good <laughs> they're just so good <laughs> I mean don't get me wrong Bunsen and Beaker can be crazy annoying sometimes <laughs> But that's like probably 2% of their existence. The other 98% is just like wholesome pureness. And yeah, <laughs> that's such an adorable. I'm sorry. What was the, what was your dog's name again? I'm sorry. Her name was Mink. Mink? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> very cute. Very cute. I know you're very busy right now. Um, I always ask guests this. Are, are you planning to get a pet in, in the future? Um, I really when are, do. Um, when things are like, a little less uh, bananas for you? Yeah, not right now. Um but I definitely want to, in within the next few years, hopefully I do really love animals and I do really love dogs. And I'm just kind of waiting to yeah, get to a point where I'm a little, a little bit more settled and I can give them the attention and the love that mm-hmm. they need. But yeah, yeah, definitely hoping to get a pet soon. Yeah, cool. Yeah, they, 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 you do need to have some kind, like, unless you have support from outside of just you. Um, yeah, dogs are a lot of work and, and you're, yeah. <laughs> you have a thousand things going on. So <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> um, that, that's an adorable pet story. Thank you for sharing that, Cheyenne. Uh, the other the other question that's a fun one we ask guests is to share with us a super fact. Um, and aside, aside from the temperature of Venus, which I'm still really having trouble wrapping my head around. Uh, <laughs> do you have a super fact you could share with us? Something that would kind of make us our brains melt. <laughs> yeah, so my favorite space fact of all time, out of everything I've learned, is the fact that almost every element in your body right now was made in past generations of stars. Like you, your your body and what your body is made of used to be part of a star at some point in the universe. Like that to me is just when you think about it, it's just wow <laughs> like what you you're, you're literally a star like that's what they say like you're you we are stardust like you're made of stars i love that um when i was young right like you're you're younger than me but when i was uh your age or younger uh carl sagan said that and uh i had to like stop and think for like days after it just like <laughs> blew my brain to smithereens uh that's that's wild uh, do you tell that to people and they just don't know what to say back? They're just like, mm-hmm, <laughs> you know? Most people I tell uh, are kind of just like, find it really cool. Or maybe they ask me like how or why, which I'm happy to explain as well, because oh. I had heard the the famous quote from Carl Sagan before, but it didn't really click until I learned the actual science behind why it's a thing. And that just made it even more amazing for me. Is it okay? So, just a follow up question: Is it true the iron in our blood, like 
iron metal that has to have come from like a dead star like that's one of the big things the big clues yeah definitely so stars like are the only thing in the universe that would create iron like there's no other process that we know of right now that would create iron apart from fusion in a star wow wow (laughs) so things made of iron like uh, our cars are stardust too like there's more than just us (laughs) yeah yeah it is everything like all the planets all the different planets are made of the only thing that wasn't made in a star there are a few other elements from a few other processes but for the most part the only thing that wasn't made in stars is hydrogen and helium because Hmm. they started off from the big bang so everything else after that was made in a star um i gotta be careful i'm gonna go down a rabbit hole and ask you a (laughs) hundred thousand questions here i'm so so interested okay well that is a very cool super fact um, I hope people who are driving, you've pulled off to the side of the road to just, just like calm down for a second. Don't get into an accident because of Cheyenne's super fact. Okay. <laughs> um, the last section of the podcast is a really, it's a fun one, but can also be r- really uh, like insightful where we ask our guests something that's important to them, um, a cause or a hobby. And um, you have two that you would like to talk about. Um and I'll let you take it away. I don't want to. I don't want to try and explain them with with without you you doing a better job. So, w- go ahead, Cheyenne. Yep. So there are a couple of things that are very dear to my heart at the moment. It's no surprise that they're space and science related. So I a few years ago I co-founded uh, Saint Lucia's first National Astronomy Association. Oh, uh, so cool. As I mentioned a bit towards the beginning of the podcast, like I did grow up in Saint Lucia, and there wasn't much happening or anything at all happening um, when it came to space. I think I probably learned about the solar system planets in primary school and beyond that, nothing really space related, no space activities, you know, stargazing, those kinds of things. Um, But somehow I discovered astrophysics and decided I wanted to do that. But I definitely wanted to change that for people in St. Lucia and people who are interested in, in astrophysics and astronomy and just show them a lot of people right now are enthusiasts and very much into stargazing, but also wanting to bring home the fact that it's something that you can have a, have a career in. Like there's so many people who think, oh, I could, like when I, I can't really do space things. I'm not smart enough. I don't know how to do science. I don't know how to do math. I don't want to be an engineer. But there's so many different skills that come into the space sector. You need the artists, the artist depictions, you need the communicators to, you know, relay information and do the press releases and all. Kind of, there's so many different, hmm. like, um, jobs you can have in the space sector. And I just want to show people that it doesn't, first of all, give them that space to explore that passion, um, but also be an example and show that it doesn't just have to stop at being a hobby. If that's all you want to do, then by all means, for sure, like space is exciting it's beautiful like that's great but I also want to show people who don't have much around them um in St. Lucia and in the rest of the Caribbean as well that you can't have a career in the space sector it's not like it's not something that's out of your reach um so it's the St. Lucia National Astronomy Association which abbreviates to LUNA which is really cool um so yeah that's one thing that I definitely care about I did mention Space Generation Advisory Council towards the beginning of the podcast and talking about um, the benefits of space technology. But then another cause that I'm very passionate about is the the black in movements that are happening um, a lot on social media recently. So black in X, but my, the one that I'm a co-organizer for is black in Astro. So it's kind of trying to build a more complete picture of what a scientist looks like. Um, traditionally you see a lot of like science is a very white male dominated field um but it's trying to show that there are there are like right now it's not very diverse but just trying to amplify the diverse voices that are in the field and trying to support um you know the ethnic minorities that are in the field as well so black in astro is kind of helping black people in astronomy fields and you know aerospace engineering and those kinds of fields find a community and find support and just amplify their voices to show people that we do exist and we are here doing really great science and encourage the younger generation that may feel discouraged by the lack of diversity, that there is a place for you and you can succeed um, in this space as well. 
very, very profound, like amazing that back in your home country, you've started this program that, uh, boy, it just gives people a foothold, like kids and adults, a foothold to, to get involved in space. And, and then the, the movement, the black and Astro also really cool. Like when, when I was growing up, like I'm a, I'm a white guy from Canada. The only people in, in space I knew about were just a bunch of white guys. The only scientists I knew about were a bunch of white guys. So I've been just, I've been loving following that hashtag and, and seeing all of the different voices that are out there. And, and that, um, like I'm a teacher, uh, I teach high school chemistry and I always like after, after I interview somebody like you, I talk about, I talk about your profile in class and the kids in my class, they can see that, oh, there's somebody that looks like me. I can do this too. Right. Instead of like when I was a kid, I don't know how many black kids when I was a kid had they're like, oh, well, the only, the only people in space I see are white people. So. Yeah, definitely, oh. definitely helps. And I didn't, I, for myself, even if I've been involved in a lot of diversity and inclusion initiatives, like throughout my time in the UK, it didn't really, um, I didn't really realize just how impactful representation was. Like, I obviously we know representation matters, but it wasn't until I found the Black and Astro community last year that I realized just how much I was missing that sense of belonging, something you don't mm. really for me, I didn't know until I experienced it. And I was like, wow, there are other people, like you say, other people who look like me in this space. So I are not doing the same thing that I'm doing. And I'm not the only black person or the only black woman in astronomy. And you you know that in the back of your mind, but if you don't meet people who are also mm-hmm. in that space, it, it kind of seems like something that you know, you don't, it doesn't, it just doesn't really feel true, even if you know that there must be somebody else somewhere in the world doing it. So having that community definitely changed my life. I think if I had it a lot earlier on in my degree, I would have had a lot, like a much better experience. So hoping that through these initiatives that we can help like the younger generation have that experience from early on and have that support from early on, because it definitely makes a big difference. Hmm. And I, I can't put myself in your shoes to feel what you, you felt. Uh, I, I, I'm a, had a totally different experience. Um, but I, I, I do teach kids and I know how important that is. And it is it in my own class, like just antidotal, it makes a huge difference having that. And just the service uh, that you've done starting that in other groups, the other black and black and botany or, you know, um, black birders week, like all of those other ones. It's just, uh, I, I, I just, I I watch it in awe and I'm just so thankful for folks like you. So thank you. Yeah. And thank you to the people who have definitely started the initiatives. I know like Ashley Walker started, like founded Black and Astro um, and people who Mm. just just founded all those different hashtags and each one has like an amazing set of people behind it. So I'm grateful Mm. to them as well. Um, But I I love Ashley. Ashley Walker? (laughs) Yes. Yeah. She's awesome. (laughs) She is. (laughs) Oh. Well, thanks for sharing your causes. Uh, we'll have links to is okay. Are they? Are, do they have websites, uh, Cheyenne? So Black and Astro has a website. Uh, okay. Luna is working on a website at the moment, but we do have social media pages, so I can share that okay. with you. Sure. If you send me links in the show notes, uh, everybody, there'll be a link to all of these different organizations if you want to learn more. And to the, I know there's a lot of educators that listen to the Science Podcast. Um, when it's get when it's time to talk space. Just show show the kids these the the page. I mean, it's pr- pretty profound. It's yep. uh, so that the, the resources are out there for you that these amazing people have made. Yep, definitely. Hmm. Well, we're at the end of uh, the interview, Cheyenne. Thank you so much for giving up your time to talk to me today. This has been so fun. I've learned so much. Um. Uh. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, of course. I'm very very happy to be here. Very happy to see to see the the person behind Benson and Beaker for sure. Oh. <laughs> um, and uh, for people who are listening, uh, I screwed up. I I was an hour late. Um, I I forgot the time zones were a little different, and I I messed up by one hour. And Cheyenne was gracious to start about uh, nine minutes late. So thank you, Cheyenne. <laughs> <laughs> no problem at all. <laughs> um, oh, one more thing: Can people follow you on social media? Where yes, where can people sure. connect with you? Yeah, definitely. So my most, I think my most exciting social media is probably Twitter. Uh, that's where most people find me. Uh, it's just my name, Cheyenne Polius. Uh You can find me on Twitter. I'm also on Instagram, more selfies than science, but trying to you know, <laughs> bring bring the two of them together as well. And of course, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, ask me any questions about 
you know, getting into astrophysics or um, just my experience in general or any other like STEM field, I'm happy to connect there as well. So just search Cheyenne Polyuse wherever you find me on whatever platform, like feel free to follow, send me a message. Um, yeah, just that that's completely fine with me. I love connecting. It's time for story time with me. Adam, if you don't know what story time is, story time is when we talk about stories that have happened within the past one or two weeks. Uh, Mom, do you have a story? I sure do. Bunsen has decided that toddler time needs to be intensified, like how beakering intensifies. It's it's toddler time intensifies. It's been every night this week where he lays down beside me and he's like, oh, rub my tummy, rub my tummy. You're not rough. And at bedtime, too. And at bedtime, too. So this is new. This is new. At bedtime, he he has been jumping into the bed and taking up the whole bed because he's a monster. (laughs) He takes it all up. up And we kind of have a princess in the pee moment. But Jason's the prince because Bunsen licks the bed and Jason can't deal with bed lick. <laughs> and, and I just he licks, he licks the bed for some inexplicable reason, like blankets, the bed, the whole thing. And so maybe it's stress. You know, I hope it's not stress. No, it's, fun. it's just I don't want to sleep in dog lick. I know, and I I can just close my eyes and go to sleep, and Jason cannot. And so it's always like you know, remember that story about the princess and the pea. And like if it's flannel or if it's a little bit scratchy, it's just death to Jason. Cause That's he, why we moved the blankets downstairs. They were scratchy. They were, yeah. He couldn't deal with the flannel sheets, even though he's Canadian. Yeah, okay, let's, go go figure. Let's sleep in freaking insulation. All you do stuff. is you close your eyes. Pinkins R factor, whatever the pink the, the the pink panther. Might as well sleep on glass shards. Glass shards. All right, but that's my story. That Bunsen. Um, is new level toddler time. That's my story. Okay, it's time for my story. My story is about Beaker, as always. Um, so if you don't know about Beaker, Beaker's a very cuddly dog. Um, she sort of like comes up and sits with you if you're doing anything on the couch. Um, unless she's um, particularly mad at you because you spun her around about five times. Wonder who that would be. It's me. Beaker... If she's sitting on the couch and you're watching a TV show, she will watch the TV show with you. She'll pay attention to it. Um, And when there's dogs on there, she'll bark at them. Um, I don't know. I guess it's like, oh, look, dogs on the TV. But she doesn't realize it's a TV. She thinks it's just actual dogs. But she'll watch the TV. She'll watch it. And she's if she's not interested, she'll put her head back down and then sleep. Um, But yeah, that's my story. Beaker watching the TV. Dad, do you have a story? Okay, so this is kind of a gross and embarrassing story. Uh, So, you know, we have chickens. Um, My father-in-law, Gord, has these chickens. Adam helps Gord with the chickens all the time. How many chickens are there, Adam? Like eight? There are Uh, nine chickens. Nine chickens and and rooster. So ten ten chickens. Ten whatevers. Anyways, so (laughs) Gord had to, he's been, he had to move their, like, the scrapings off the bottom of the coop. And stupid me, he's like, hey, where should we put all this these scrapings? I was like, I don't care, down the hill. Um, so he used the skid steer, which is like a little mini bobcat that we have, and moved like a huge bucket full of like a year's worth of chicken poop and sawdust and dumped it down the hill. No problem, right? It's going to snow soon. Oh, my goodness. As soon as the dogs get outside, they run right to the chicken poop and want to play in it and eat it. And it's a nightmare. So today... On the when I took them out for a walk, they were they they go screaming out of the house and they fight for a little bit, which is hilarious. And they went around the the other way of the house, and I was like, "Aha! I'll cut them off." So I ran and stood in front of where the chicken poop pile is, and they saw me, and boy, were they disappointed. They're like, "Oh, he's there!" And Beaker's like, "Beaker's like, I'm gonna I'm gonna deke around him, but nope, she didn't get by me, as I'm a goalie and I protect getting scored on with by." On the chicken poop. I don't know. Figure out your own analogy. It's disgusting. I can't wait for it to snow. So it's all covered up in snow. That's my disgusting story. That's the end of story time. Uh, Hope to see you guys on the next time on the podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. That's it for this week's show. Thanks for coming back week after week to listen to the Science Podcast. Also, special thanks to Cheyenne Pulius, who's the astrophysicist that talked to us today. I loved her chat. She's so inspirational. We'd also like to give a special shout out to our top tier patrons on Patreon. 
Without their support, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. Some really exciting news is coming down the pipe, and it's because of their support we were able to make it possible. All right, Chris, take it away. Let's hear the patrons' names. Chris Kelly, Samantha Dodd, Kimberly Bond, Nate Stephenson, Debbie Anderson, Courtney Proven, Renee Hardy, Mary Ryder, Shelby Leggett, Dan Fry, Mary Coos, Kat Lynch, Marianne McNally, Andrea Persons, Elizabeth Bourgeois, Karen Beth St. George, Bianca Hyde, Leela Prilio, Lynn Armstrong, Lisa Swartz, Catherine Jordan, Donna Craig, Lila Ashier, Jody Ogren, Liz Button, Kathy Zerker, and Ben Rather. For science, empathy, and cuteness.